Good morning, everyone. Uh, so today, I'm going to talk about managing microservices applications with Istio. Uh, my name is Swaminathan Vasudevan, and I'm a software engineer senior uh, at SOSA. Uh, so let's go deep dive into the microservices applications with Istio without wasting any time. So what's the need for microservices? So today in this world, um, there's a lot of applications that we have already um, done and it's running in your data center, in your offices, and multiple people are utilizing your applications. And all those, most of the applications are pretty much monolithic, uh, huge in size, and it has its own advantages and disadvantages. But going to the cloud era where people are moving from local offices to remote offices, uh, from local data centers to remote data centers, moving their uh, whole payload into the cloud infrastructure, um, it makes sense to see how we can actually split our applications into uh, multiple smaller chunks. And also, um, monolithic applications, if you talk about monolithic applications, um, they are, as I said, they are pretty much huge. And one thing um, that is pretty sure is they are not scalable. And uh, if anything goes wrong with the monolithic application, it's pretty much hard to debug because um, there are multiple uh, things involved in the monolithic applications. And isolation, fault isolation is pretty much uh, difficult. And also what happens is um, we have a long way to go in order to update a, a product in the field and we can't do uh, pretty much uh, a smoother rollout with all those complex products. And the other thing is um, it's a three-tier architecture and uh, it has a database, it has a business logic and it has an uh, UI logic. And if you wanted to come up with a new product, what you might have to do is uh, you might have to roll up the whole product with all the support from everyone and all the testing has to be done and then it has to be uh, sent to the customers, published, and then it has to be rolled out in a phased approach. So all these complexities are there in a monolithic applications. And when you are moving into a, a cloud era where we are talking about uh, different options like uh, um, Google Cloud or Amazon Cloud where you can actually deploy services, uh, these things kind of um, negate yourselves because what happens is in a monolithic application, you can't actually completely push a, a huge monolithic application um, into a container and run it uh, in a Kubernetes environment. That makes more difficult. So there is always a need for microservices and uh, given the need for microservices and given the advancements in the area of cloud and uh, Kubernetes in the container world, uh, let us see how we are going to tackle these things um, going from a monolithic era to a microservices era. So I briefly talked about what is a monolithic application. So monolithic applications, as I said, are built on a single unit and enterprises and other people are actually having a three-tier architecture with a user interface, server, and a database. And also, as I already mentioned, a developer must build it, deploy it, and update a version of the monolithic application if there is any change to it. Even if there is change to a single layer, he has to completely wipe it off and redo it. So uh, it's not like uh, agile, you kind of do it uh, a bits and pieces. You have to do it a complete uh, rollover, uh, which is tedious. And uh, given the time constraint and given the way the people work today, uh, because the people work 24 by 7, and then uh, bringing down um, a network or a product is not a good option to do. So the, uh, this is a typical uh, view of a monolithic application, what you see here, uh, which has a user interface, a business layer, data face, interface layer, and a database. So um, you, in a monolithic application, uh, developers would be working on um, database. There are database developers, and people will be working on business logics, and there are user interfaces, and people will be working on user interfaces. And all these things has to come together. Um, they have to tie it up together, test it together, and then validate it, and then uh, publish it for uh, re-rolling it. And when the operators get it, they have to test it, validate it, uh, put it into their sandbox, make sure that everything works, and then do a rollover, uh, which is pretty much tedious. So. Um, I have briefly captured the disadvantages I just talked about uh, monolithic application. 
scaling of a monolithic application is, is always a challenge. And anyway, um, as monolithic applications, as features go in and in, 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 into the monolithic application, they actually grow larger and larger in size and the complexity increases. So anything that happens within a monolithic application, it's pretty much difficult to debug because there's a lot of things that went in and there's a lot of things that you need to explain to a group of developers that has done it and there's different layers to it. So it's, it's pretty much difficult to debug it. And then you can't reuse the same uh, things that you've done um, within a monolithic application for multiple use cases because you can't reuse certain modules. Uh, certain libraries can be reused, but doesn't mean that you can actually reuse the actual service. And then uh, it's very difficult to get an operational agility um, because of the deployment issues. And monolithic applications, uh, as I mentioned, um, they are developed as a huge stack and uh, with this one, um, it actually has a limitation with respect to tools and what languages that they're using to develop it and how people can understand it and how it can be distributed. So in the case of microservices architecture, um, there are different things to be considered where moving from a monolithic application to a microservices architecture um, requires a lot of thinking. What happens is you need to actually uh, try to figure it out what are the advantages and where do we have main advantages of moving from monolithic to microservices architecture? If you go talk to any people uh, who does have a product today, which is a, a huge monolithic application, which is not microservices based, um, the initial reaction from them would be, oh, okay, I don't want to change it right now because a lot, there's a lot of code that has went in, a lot of invention that has gone in. And it's pretty much difficult to go back and roll everything because it's a, like a 20 year product or a 30 year product. And these things cannot be um, in a day rolled over to microservices architecture. So the, the thing here is uh, like, um, you don't need to do it in a single day. The advantages of microservices architecture is you can actually go step by step. Uh, we can actually follow a strangler method where you can actually take your monolithic application and see what makes sense for your um, application and how you can actually slowly split your monolithic application into simple chunks of services that you can actually isolate and then later those services can be actually deployed as microservices. So in this case, like as I said, like there are a lot of um, the three tier architecture, basically you take your um, database services um, and then business logic and, and then and then your uh, data interfaces or uh, your UI. You take it and then you can actually run multiple things in a different services like say for example if it is if your web client or if your web server is actually servicing your web users then you can actually remove your web server and run it as a separate service and remove your database uh, interfaces and run it as a separate services. So in that case, these services can be individual and they cannot, they don't need to rely on each other uh, for the purpose of development. And they can actually go into the deployment phase um, independently without any uh, issues. The problem comes like in a monolithic application is they are all dependent, so they have to go together. They, there is no separate rollout because in this case, what happens is say, for example, if a database, um, there is a vulnerability bug in a database and it has to be fixed and those bugs will be fixed in a database. And what happens is uh, if it is a monolithic application, you need to actually roll over the complete product because there is a vulnerable bug fix that has come in and uh, we have to test it end to end, make sure that everything works. And then we have to push in the code, do the rollback all those things happens. But in the case of uh, microservices architecture, each one can be done in an individual fashion where the bugs can be fixed and then you can have a parallel things running with a different version. You can actually slowly do a rollover. You can actually send some traffic to the version one, send uh, uh, other traffic to the version two, make sure that they both um, service your customers and if everything works out then you slowly do a rollover so those things can be done in a microservices architecture and also you can have a redundancy in the case of microservices architecture at multiple level of layers and also um, so in this case um, the fault isolation is pretty much easy because you you specifically know where the fault is happening uh, and you can actually isolate and you can actually uh, provide a lot of security uh, for all these things 
uh, that is one thing that we we will be discussing during um, the next couple of slides where how we are going to apply the security and how it is secured in a fashion and how it actually provides um, redundancy for all your apps so basically moving from monolithic applications to microservices architecture um, there is a planning required make sure that you you pre-plan for it uh, and make sure uh, you do incremental steps don't go uh, ahead and do everything in, in a hastily manner. Uh, take it uh, one slice at a time. Um, try to split your uh, application into services and then uh, out of out of the services, see which service makes more sense to actually go in first and then try to push in that service along with your monolithic application. Try to split it apart and see how it works. And then if everything works, then try to rip, rip apart the other parts and then try to create multiple service chunks. And then you can actually run all those services uh, in a microservices environment in a container world. So moving on to the uh, next slide. So we talked about the micro, uh, benefits of microservices architecture. I'm just going to briefly um, read through to have a recap. So it enables an application to be broken down into multiple component services, as I mentioned already, and enables continuous delivery because what happens is like you can actually constantly deliver your uh, product to your customers uh, without waiting for um, like a six month rollover or a one year rollover. So as and when you have a fix, you can actually uh, deliver a service uh, component and then the service component can be uh, rolled over and it provides scalability and reusability since it's very efficient. And each service can be deployed and developed independently because you have uh, multiple teams working on it and each and every team need not know about the complete flow of the product. What you can do is just take your database services and start working, so take your web server and start working and see how it works with your web UI. And those are the things that you need to focus on. You don't need to have a complete product uh, for testing and validating. And as I said, uh, fault isolation uh, is, is a better thing uh, with respect to microservices. So again, it simplifies um, the security monitoring because there's various parts of an app are isolated. And again, components can be distributed across multiple servers or even multiple data centers. This, uh, I think I mentioned it earlier, uh, in this cloud era, like when we are moving from um, local data centers to distributed data centers and to the cloud-based approach, uh, either to Google, through Amazon, uh, having your apps running in those environments, what happens is you make sure um, that your product can be distributed and run a, in a distributed environment. So. This kind of microservices architecture helps you uh, run in a distributed environment. Uh, but in the case of monolithic, you cannot run it in a distributed environment. You have to run it all co-located. And then again, uh, your code can be organized based on business capabilities and all these microservices code um, has a generic uh, way of configuring and uh, responding to RESTful APIs. So it's pretty much easy for you to manage and maintain it. And again, with the advancement of the containers and Kubernetes, it's pretty easy for us to deploy and manage microservices um, in a distributed environment. So that bring, brings into the next slide where we are going to talk about the Kubernetes architecture and how the control flow works in the Kubernetes architecture in today's world. So if you look at Kubernetes, um, the Kubernetes always has a master node and you can, have, you can have a number of worker nodes. And the master node basically has the core components in it, um, basically the controller part of it, where it has a main part API server that actually is servicing the users and the operators on how what they can actually configure in a Kubernetes world. And then the API server talks to the controller manager where the controller manager makes the uh, rightful decisions and it configures whatever is required for the Kubernetes. And there is a scheduling part where it takes place, where it goes and sees how many resources that I do have, the worker node is capable of handling this resource or if it is uh, lacking this resource, if it is lacking, then it will try to scale it in a different worker node. And then you also have a, a data store uh, in order to maintain the key value pairs uh, at CD. So basically the kube CDL is your UI where using the kube controller. You just talk to the API server, configure your Kubernetes uh, container cluster, and then the Kubernetes uh, controller manager then tries to schedule your um, parts and containers um, on the respective worker nodes uh, using the kubelet. 
And basically, if you then want to have any services uh, exposed, uh, any uh, containers actually uh, exposed as a service to the outside world, then you actually expose it as a service, and then all the services from the outside world comes to the queue proxy, and it gets distributed to whatever part that you want it to reach and whatever the containers that you want it to reach. So the Kubernetes actually uh, provides uh, infrastructure to add in uh, your CNI, um, container networking infrastructure that actually provides your networking aspects to your uh, parts and also provides the basic functionality for uh, securing your parts uh, using IP tables. So challenges with microservices at a scale. Um, so we talked about what monolithic is. We talked about what is the need to move from monolithic to microservices. And we talked about um, the advantages of microservices. And we also talked about uh, today's advancement in the field of cloud versus Kubernetes and how it actually implements microservices architecture. So now we also have some challenges with microservices uh, at a higher scale. Things to consider uh, for a complex, scalable, and resilient microservices architecture. So as I mentioned, Kubernetes always already provides a framework to deploy and manage your container infrastructure. And when the service number increases, we basically need to deal with um, ways of interaction between the services, how the services are going to be interacted. Are the services secure enough? Are the service actually um, healthy enough for me that is running? Uh, and do I have a fault tolerance option? And then do I have a way to log? Can I use telemetry to provide all the information to my um, monitoring uh, apps? Can I collect metrics? Um, does it provide circuit breaking? And then any multi-point failures or more can be, um, should be actually diagnosed and fixed. So those are the challenges that uh, a microservices architecture in a higher scale um, in an enterprise class environment uh, are the basic requirements. So we need to make sure all these requirements are being met uh, in a microservices environment before we actually try to move into a microservices environment. So um, for all these things today, we do have, um, there's a lot of um, things that are happening uh, in the world today, in the tech world. And uh, today it, it is pretty much stable and it is available uh, for everyone to consume that uh, we do have um, a concept of service mesh. So what is service mesh? Basically a service mesh is nothing but um, you have interconnected services um, that are networked together and uh, this creates a, a network of services uh, for a particular product that you wanted to work with. And this mesh, service mesh, um, also not only creates um, a networking of services, but also provides um, traffic management, uh, it provides um, security, control, and also observability. So all these things are the main core concepts of a service mesh. So the service mesh has to provide um, control, has to provide observability, has to provide security, and then has to provide traffic management. So all these things um, are part of a service mesh, and this has to be uh, provided by uh, any service mesh providers that are out there that actually can help a microservices architecture to uh, work properly in a high-scale environment. So service mesh comes um, with a couple of risks um, to the rescue of the enterprise customers that are out there um, to actually help. So as I mentioned, the service mesh addresses the challenges that the developers and operators face today, which are not done by monolithic applications. And service mesh actually transparently decouples this complexity from your application and puts it in a service proxy. And the service proxy handles it for you. So basically how service mesh uh, handles all these things is through the introduction of service proxies. So the service proxies are actually um, inserted into the service mesh uh, for every, between every service mesh, um, there is a service proxy um, on both sides where it is connected. The service proxy takes the responsibility of uh, securing your product. And all these things actually happen without the knowledge of the services that are running in the um, 
in the microservice containers. So what happens is the container runs services and when you enable service mesh uh, in your deployment, the service mesh's responsibility is, is, is to automatically inject your uh, proxies, service mesh proxies, um, in between the services so that the services are secure enough and then any um, traffic management or anything that you want, uh, fault isolation or, or metrics monitoring, all those our security is all handled through the proxies and uh, the proxy takes care of it uh, by actually contacting the control plane um, that the service mesh provides so all these are done by the control plane of the service mesh provider the service mesh providers has a control plane and a data plane the control plane has the concept of providing uh, traffic management discovery load balancer and then it actually also provides um, security through authentication and then encryption and then it also provides um, config management as well as monitoring and metrics so all these are provided by the control plane the control plane basically um, its responsibility is to first install the proxy in between the service uh, um, services that are running that are tied together and then the service proxies then talk to the service controller service mesh control plane and then they actually um, try to convey that what kind of service types that they are and so basically what happens is the service mesh control path has a discovery uh, feature where it can actually discover the services and based on the service name and the domain it can actually provide it can actually identify what kind of service it's running and based on what kind of services it's running um, and what are the, the the policies that are being applied, um, those can be pushed to the respective service proxies to be applied on the policy enforcement points. The policy enforcement points are basically actually on the service proxies um, and on both sides of the service proxy. And also the security uh, encryption tunnel is also on the service proxies. So all these are handled by the service mesh. So that's why um, it's pretty much advantageous uh, for the customers to include service mesh in their uh, deployments because this enhances your microservices architecture, removes some of the complexities and issues that you may be having in a microservices environment uh, and the service mesh handles everything for you. So uh, I briefly mentioned about all the points uh, earlier, but I'm just going to go over what it is in here just for the capture point. So service proxies are, offer functionalities, traffic management, circuit breaking, service discovery, authentication, monitoring, security, and more. Um, so we talked about service proxies. So the, what are those service proxies? Basically, the service mesh depends upon a service proxy feature, which is, um, which is basically an Envoy. Uh, Envoy is, is basically a service proxy. And uh, it's also uh, it can be also used as an edge proxy uh, in certain cases if you want to configure a gateway or something. So in this case, uh, service and edge proxy it supports HTTP, gRPC, MongoDB, and uh, dynamic DB. And there are some more protocols that are in the pipeline that it can support. And it does advanced load balancing. Um, so it supports L7, canary rollouts, retries, circuit breaking, and rate limits. So in, in terms of security, it provides authorization and uh, mutual TLS uh, uh, between the services so that all the traffic that goes between the services are uh, encrypted and goes through the tunnel. Uh, and in, in the terms of observability, uh, it provides metrics and tracing uh, options for you to uh, see what's happening um, between the layers. And in terms of extendability, um, it has Go extensions and then the widely used Wasm extensions, Lua, and etc. So all these um, allow, because um, basically the Envoy has been developed um, on a C++ backend. Um, so what happens is, um, since it's C++, uh, even though it is C++, it can be used in multiple languages and uh, across along with multiple services based on all these extendable um, options that they have. So um, Go is widely adopted right now and go, it supports Go extension and also the Wasm which is basically used by uh, most of the apps right now. So based on these extensions, anyone can actually um, use or utilize the Envoy proxies 
to do the respective stuff. So if you see the picture right on the right side, um, there's an envoy proxy in between services um, on the uh, on the right side, service B of different versions, and service A on the left side. And uh, you can see um, that you can actually the service A can send information to service B, and Envoy um, is a proxy in between, and Envoy can actually load balance between the services. They can actually rate limit. Um, they can actually do weightage-based uh, load balancing. They can do uh, fault isolation. All those things can be done with respect to Envoy. So now moving on to uh, the main part that we are to talk is Istio. So we talked about um, a service mesh, we talked about service proxy, we talked about microservices architecture, when we talked about monolithic application. Now, we are going to talk about Istio, which is basically a, a service mesh infrastructure uh, provider. So the Istio provides your service mesh to your deployments. So basically, it, it provides all the advantages that we already talked about uh, that are provided by a service mesh. So it provides an easy way to create a network deployed services with load balancing, service-to-service -service authentication, monitoring, and more. So the main key concepts that these TOs supports are um, they are control, observability, security, and configuration. So in this case, um, so if you see the picture on the right side, um, so there is a service A and service B um, containers. And um, if you want, if a service A wants to talk to service B, uh, all the communications are being transferred um, through the proxy, the Envoy proxy. So this Envoy proxy is basically um, a service mesh proxy that has been um, installed uh, by the Istio. And um, I briefly mentioned about the Istio's control plane and the data plane. So if you look at the pictures in here, uh, the control plane of Istio has um, APIs that you can actually, APIs and CRDs that you can actually use to configure uh, what you wanted to configure in as part of the control options into the Istio. And then the Istio has a pilot uh, which basically uh, deals with uh, discovery, traffic management, um, and fault isolation, all those things. And then Citadel um, actually provides uh, certificate management uh, authentication, encryption, and then the mixer actually takes care of uh, monitoring and metrics, all these things. So all these control plane, um, control planes functionality is to actually insert the proxy in, in place in between the services and then uh, push the configurations for any traffic management or, or any policy management into the proxies uh, to the point of enforcement and then um, make it work, and then allow the proxies to redirect the traffic based on the policies that has been configured, um, either traffic management policy or fault isolation policy, uh, anything based on the service name, um, because the, the major advantage of this one is it is, does not need to know much about the service. All it does is requires to know about the service name, and then the domain. Based on the service name and domain, you can do whatever you want. And based upon the incoming traffic, um, you can actually uh, select based on um, whichever the incoming traffic is based on protocol. You can select the re to redirect the traffic, or you can actually select based on the user, based on the service name. So there's a lot of flexibility involved with this one so that the the policies are enforced on the proxy, and then the traffic is being forwarded to the service B. And as I mentioned, um, there is a question uh, you can ask that, okay, what happens in the microservices environment where um, there can be an option for man in the middle um, attack? So in that case, uh, what happens is, uh, that's, why, that's why we need uh, security between uh, service A and service B always um, enabled um, so that there's, there cannot be man in the middle, middle attack. So in that way, um, there is a certificate infrastructure that Istio provides, and all the certificates can be, uh, certificate requests can actually originate from the Envoy proxy agent, and the Envoy proxy agent talks to the Istio um, agent, and the Istio agent talks to the Istio daemon or the Istio server, and then Istio server uh, sends the request uh, for the CSR to the Citadel. Citadel actually signs the certificates and sends it back, and then once the certificates are installed, um, then um, it uses the MTLS option um, and encrypts the traffic between the proxies so that it is pretty much secure enough for you to send 
the traffic from service A to service B. So there is no issue with respect to uh, service brokerage. But there are some um, corner cases where um, the protocols that are supported by Envoy proxy are the only ones that you can actually support um, at this point. So we, if there is, uh, I already mentioned what are the protocols that are currently supported by Envoy proxy and what are in the pipeline. So if you need any kind of, new, if you are having a unique protocol that you wanted to support, you can either write your own uh, extensions to that uh, using the Golang extensions or using the Wasm. Otherwise, what you can do is, um, you can use an additional uh, third-party way of um, preventing your traffic. So moving on to the uh, next slide. Um, so this is again a brief overview of the control plane that I just talked about. Um, Istio provides an automatic load balancing for HTTP, gRPC, WebSocket, and TCP traffic. Again, um, you can actually fine grain your traffic behavior um, with rules, retries, failovers, fault injection. Again, you can actually provide access controls, rate limits, and quotas. Um, you can actually get the metrics, logs, and traces for all traffic within a cluster based on the control plane features that we do have. And then you can actually secure service-to-service -service communication in a cluster. So all these things can be done. Um, but um, there is one thing that um, I would like to suggest. OK, after this slide, I will uh, let you know. So Istio initially started with the control plane with uh, multiple different services like pilot is a service mixer is a service citadel is a service and they wanted to themselves actually um try to utilize the microservice infra architecture and then they actually um created the control plane with multiple services uh, pilot mixer citadel um they're all services um and then as i mentioned pilot already uh, provides connectivity communication discovery traffic management load balancing and then the mixer actually provides monitoring and observability uh citadel actually provides encryption and authentication so in, in all these cases um all these services are actually initially we're running in the microservices um, architecture but recently um within the latest release that has happened in the uh, in this starting of this month um so they have actually pushed all these microservices into a single monolithic um, app uh, or a daemon called Istio D. So now there is no more pilot mixer or set all individual things. They moved into Istio D. You can ask me a question, why did they move from microservices to uh, a single app? Because the reason uh, for going into microservices is you can you expect individual components to be updated at any time. And, and then there is always um, rollover of individual components in the um, in a uh, microservice environment. But in the case of Istio, when they release the control plane, it's always they're releasing based on whatever the version that they are targeting for. And it's not, it's always going to be uh, released together and tested together. So they then decided that they are not actually fulfilling the actual uh, rules of the microservices architecture uh, where um, it's individual components are not replaced at, uh, at multiple different times and it's not uh, rolled over. Uh, constantly so they moved to a single thing um, that way actually um, it's less maintainability because it's a single thing and for the operators and they can install it uh, not much of complexity so now uh, istio control plane is just running in istio d uh, so istio data plane consists of ny proxies um, as i already mentioned so the control planes responsibility is to deploy the envoy proxies provide the certificates discover the services and then uh, just enroll the traffic management policies and the uh, rules and access controls. So the data path is through the Envoy proxy. So once the secure tunnel is being established between the Envoy proxies, the data traffic actually goes through the Envoy proxies. So that is the responsibility of the data plane. So, um, so this is an overview about um, a sidecar injection. Um, so here I have taken an example where um, the Kubernetes is running in a pod um, without a Cilium, without a CNI, which is basically a Cilium in this case that I'm going to discuss about. And um, if you have a, a regular uh, CNI, generic CNI, whatever, there are a lot of CNIs that are available today, uh, CNI, like Cilium, Flannel, uh, so whatever you want, you can choose your own uh, CNIs. But in the case, um, in a regular case, what happens is from service A to service B, if a traffic has to reach, uh, so and if you have some IP tables rules already uh, deployed for your 
policies. So what happens is the service has to go through uh, multiple socket layers to reach the loopback interface, come back to the Envoy, and then from Envoy to Envoy, there is again another TCP connection that's being established. And then uh, that has to be terminated on the Envoy side. This is how they isolate the traffic. And then again, from Envoy to the service, there's another TCP connection. So there's multiple hops within, um, within the pod as well as across the pod before the traffic reaches the services. So even though the sidecar provides all the functionalities and advantages of providing um, secure communications and then uh, providing access control rules and traffic management, there are some um, a slight um, issue with the performance when there are multiple uh, TCP hops in here. So that is to be noted. So um, we are going to talk about uh, how um, Cilium works with Istio. Cilium is again a, a CNI that the Kubernetes uses today and how uh, Cilium helps Istio or Istio helps Cilium. In both cases, we're going to see the advantages and disadvantages. So how Cilium enhances Istio with socket aware EBF programs. So Cilium and EBPF programs enhances Istio. That's what we are going to see now. So basically, Istio provides all the service mesh capabilities that, you, that a user or an operator requires for microservices architecture. And Cilium provides um, network policy enforcement uh, for the container networking infrastructure using eBPF filters. So when you combine both these things together, you get uh, a couple of advantages. What happens is, uh, as I already mentioned, the sidecar proxies um, or the service mesh proxies, they do support a couple of protocols, but there are some protocols that are still uh, in the pipeline. And if there are certain protocols that are not supported by them, then if you want to secure those protocols, then that can be done by through the CDM. And again, if there is a compromised sidecar, um, so if a sidecar has been compromised, so what happens is uh, Cilium can enforce a rule, say that um, it can actually reduce the level of security, um, meaning reduce the level of access for the users and increase the level of security in, on those containers when the sidecar has been compromised. And then <clears throat> in, in multi-container environment as well, um, you can actually have um, a container without a sidecar proxy uh, can talk to a container with a sidecar proxy, and still you can actually apply your rules um, using the Cilium policy rules. So Cilium has uh, done some work internally, uh, taking the Istio code and actually um, writing a, a wrapper to their uh, proxy layer, and then using the Cilium filtering capabilities can be actually, um, you can actually push the policy rules to the Istio, and the Istio can apply all those rules to the proxy. So that's how uh, Cilium provides advantages to the EBPF. And again, uh, we just saw about the insertion of the sidecar proxies uh, for the C without the Cilium, and we see uh, multiple TCP hops within a part and across the parts uh, from uh, traffic from service A to service B. But in the case of uh, Cilium and Istio, uh, using the EBPF socket aware programs, what we can do is, um, uh, it can actually reduce the number of hops, uh, the TCP hops that you're doing uh, when you're sending traffic from service A to service B using the SOC ops option that the eBPF provides. So this one I already talked about what the Cilium is. So Cilium provides a transparent uh, networking policy management feature and networking for the container infrastructure. So it uses the eBPF data path for providing uh, all those filtering capabilities. Um, so CDM can also provide a chaining capability for multiple CNIs to just utilize their networking uh, policy enforcement. And also um, it's used in Kubernetes. And then the policy can be enforced based on identity, IP CIDR, DNS, API. And then any multi-cluster environment, you can utilize it using an encryption. Uh, so it can provide encryption for multi-cluster. Uh, so if the packet has to traverse from one cluster to another cluster, then the encryption can be applied. And it's available Linux kernel from 4.9 and above. And uh, again, it uses um, Envoy and Istio integration, um, native Envoy and Istio integration, as I mentioned. Um, that's how they can actually use um, Istio and still use some provide some advantages over Istio using Cilium. So Cilium CNI uh, with Kubernetes, so this is just an overview of how Cilium CNI um, 
plugs into the Kubernetes infrastructure. So whenever a, a container is being deployed, the CLM CNI um, agent, CLM agent requests uh, to create a BPF map, and then that map actually hooks to the BPF hook, which actually creates a BPF hook on the devices uh, in the Linux kernel. So that way we are able to um, create a BPF program for each containers and then deploy the uh, programs. And when, he, and when any packet uh, traverses those devices uh, using the BPF hook, uh, we are able to uh, get the packet, apply the rules, uh, and then provide the policies. So Kubernetes cluster with Cilium CNI. Uh, so when you employ, deploy the Cilium networking CNI, uh, you do have a Kubernetes cluster, uh, and you have a container a um, and the container B and container C. This, this is a multi-container part, and how the uh, connections are made through the Cilium uh, networking is shown in here because there are two devices that basically connect from Cilium CNI to the container, which is basically the ETH0 and the LXC, the ETH pairs. So uh, all the policy enforcements are done on those devices, and that's how the Cilium uh, actually pr uh, provides policy enforcement onto the container devices. So moving on to the next slide. Um, so transparent cyclone injection with Cilium. So we talked about how the, without Cilium, how the sidecar injection was done and how the traffic was uh, traversing um, on multiple TCP hops. So with the injection of Cilium, what happens is the Cilium uses the SOC ops option in the Cilium eBPF filters um, to make use of the SOC op option. So using SOC op option, what happens is um, Cilium only uses um, one TCP hop for the first TCP hop to establish the connection and for any other uh, successful or successive packets, what happens is just uses the socket to socket communication without traversing the whole stack uh, and sending the packets because Cilium does not use IP tables uh, anymore uh, with kube proxy free environment. Uh, it basically uses sock ops and sends the traffic to the envoy. Um, so that way um, we have seen uh, a performance increase in the packets that are being sent out using the Cilium envoy and Istio service mesh. So service proxy performance improvements, um, as I just talked about. Um, so here is the graph that shows uh, the number of requests versus the persistent connections. Um, so we see uh, a substantial increase in the performance uh, when you actually use Cilium and SockMap when compared to the ordinary loopback and IP tables redirect. So in this case, uh, it's better to use Istio with Cilium since we have a uh, lot more advantages that the Cilium can provide on top of Istio when you go in for a microservices architecture. Cilium protects uh, also, um, so these are the pictures that actually can show um, the in detail about uh, what Cilium does uh, for the ECO traffic. So I already I mentioned, uh, it actually protects the compromised sidecar. So if any container has a compromised um, Envoy sidecar, so what it can actually do is uh, actually it can provide the, the least privilege to those uh, parts by using Cilium, because even though the Envoy is compromised. And also uh, you can actually have uh, uh, policies applied for the container uh, for different protocols that are not supported by Envoy. Again, Cilium secures uh, multi-container parts. So this one we discussed briefly earlier. Um, so if you have uh, multi-container parts, uh, Cilium can actually uh, provide uh, access rules uh, for those uh, containers which are, which are not using the Envoy proxies and which are not part of the uh, Istio mesh. So what happens is uh, Cilium can actually support side-by-side uh, -side containers uh, that are uh, supported by Istio and containers that are non-supported by Istio. That's what it uh, basically provides. And uh, in the case of service-to-service -service, uh, MTLS, um, so today with Istio and Cilium, we do provide uh, MTLS connection between the Envoy. This is how the secure connection is being done. So this is a regular one that Cilium also uh, supports for MTLS, but there is a new feature um, that's been um, in development and it's also available uh, in the latest kernels, which is called uh, the 
KTLS. So in this case, what happens is um, when we have um, the, uh, the kernel has an option uh, to offload the SSL uh, keys to the Envoy proxy from the app. So if you wanted to send any traffic uh, from service A to an external service, which is not in the cluster, but it is in, in an external cloud environment. So in that case, in a regular environment, what happens is these keys um, have to be have to come from the containers, uh, the service by itself, and so um, there is um, the keys has to be uh, processed, and then the encryption has to be done from the app to the Envoy and from Envoy uh, to the external services. So this this was actually introducing a little bit of latency um, in the applications um, and the performance implication. So with the KTLS, um, the kernel has a feature to expose the SSL. Uh, to the Envoy, and so that there doesn't need to be any encryption from service A to Envoy, but only the encryption needs to happen from Envoy uh, to the external services. So in that case, uh, there was a substantial increase in the performance that was actually realized uh, with deferred KTLS. So this feature um, works with Cilium along with the support from kernel. Um, so you need to turn on the kernel option uh, to expose that uh, SSL option, and then once that that is being done, then therefore KTLS uh, KTLS can work. So we are now coming to the end of our discussion. Uh, so we talked about uh, just to summarize, we talked about what monolithic application, what are microservices, and uh, what are the uh, issues with microservices at higher scale, and how service mesh can actually solve those problems and what is the service mesh that is available today, which is basically Istio, and then how Istio supports service mesh is through Envoy proxy and through their control plane and data plane. And what are the, uh, so there are some pitfalls in Istio, uh, the way it works um, in the case of Kubernetes and how it can be uh, overcome by uh, including Cilium along with the Istio. So even if it is, if the sidecar has been uh, bypass or compromise, then we can actually apply the rules. And if you want to have uh, Istio and regular services, then how to apply the traffic rules. So you can still use Cilium for that. So this actually will actually provide um, an enterprise customers a complete solution, like how they can actually deploy um, a microservices um, architecture uh, of an app in a cloud-based uh, Kubernetes environment using Cilium and Istio. So why Istio matters, just to summarize, uh, so Istio is stable, has valuable features, allows more granular level security, okay? So it, again, it, it helps to control, um, connect, and then secure your products, and actually it provides um, monitoring capabilities, observability, and also provides auto-tracing, logging, and monitoring. Um, and with Cilium, we get added performance and security features. So. This is to summarize what, uh, why do you need Istio um, along with your microservices infrastructure. So to the conclusion, service mesh is an excellent infrastructure addition for a microservices architecture. And if you use um, Istio along with Cilium and along with uh, your Kubernetes infrastructure with the clear uh, definition and architecture of how to split your monolithic app into multiple services and how you can actually deploy those things uh, it's an excellent uh, option for uh, enterprise customers to deploy. So because Istio already does whatever things that are required by the customers without the knowledge of services, you don't need, there is no language barrier for Istio. There is no need for the services to know what the Istio does. And uh, using sidecar proxies, it does everything for you. Traffic management, fault isolation, monitoring, uh, metrics collection, telemetry, and then discovery and load balancing. So all these things are done, and then anything that the telemetry provides, um, you you can actually look in through a Grafana graph that, that likes to provide you the complete graph, and it also provides your, uh, basically your flow control to see um, where the service where the service calls are actually flowing from which service to which service. So all those things are um, very helpful tools for the customers to actually uh, envision what's happening in a microservices environment. Yeah if someone thinks it's more complex. And again, STO has a secure tear, so you don't need to worry about any man in the middle attack. Um, so it's pretty much off. STO provides the tools that you need to run microservices architecture. STO is resilient, it's routing and observable. So with this one, I can actually conclude uh, my talk. So basically, we have gone through from monolithic 
to microservices and what should we be using uh, to go to a microservices architecture, what are the issues that we have, how to resolve that, and how Istio resolves it uh, in combination with Cilium. So uh, any question and answers, you can submit it for your questions, and I will be uh, happy to answer your questions. That's all I have. Um, thank you for the listening to my talk. Uh, thank you for all the audience uh, who listen in uh, during these tough times. Um, I think it's better to at least learn some new things and to come up with uh, new options, new design uh, in the next year so that uh, we hopefully have a good and good year ahead. Thank you.